Welcome to Chimecast, where we break through and cut the BS in sports medicine, rehabilitation, and sports performance, and talk about how things really work. Welcome to Chimecast, episode one. I'm here with my crew, Evan Hogger, Aaron Crouch, Russ Dunning. We're with Chime, and we're sports medicine professionals, physical therapists, strength conditioning coaches, really searching the, the world for the best options in human performance. So first things first, and let's start with why, as always. Why, why would we do this? Why another podcast? Why a new thing? Why speak to the, to the world this way? And for us, it's always been about the idea of we feel like the old way, the old methodology simply doesn't work. And there's, there's better ways to do things and really trying to focus and, and impress upon the, the community following how to, how to do things better in a more effective, more efficient way. So we really want to push this to sports medicine, things that move the needle and things that are efficient, effective, and really cut the crap and, and get down to the bottom line. So, so the next step is to have a beer. So Ev, what are we drinking tonight? Excellent. Before we do that, you introduced us, but you didn't introduce yourself. So. Oh, yeah. Tony, Tony Mikla. Tony Mikla. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> for, for, our, for our inaugural episode, we're going with a, with a local California beer. It's a strong one that packs a punch. We're going Pliny the Elder. It's a nine percenter. So this will get things going pretty, yeah, uh, pretty quickly. But it, but it tastes light. Yeah, I think that's the secret, yeah. right? That's, that's the yeah. dangerous thing about it. And they always come in these large bottles that seem much more than 12 ounces. Yeah. Very careful, Evan. If they call you for a spokesmanship, I mean, you can't deny it. After something <laughs> like that, that was pretty smooth. <laughs> delivery. Awesome delivery. All right. So first topic, once we get rolling here, is we're going to take on uh, discussing some main features about the ACL. Uh, some things that obviously that we see clinically every day. At the end of the day, we're on the ground with with clients, working with people on a regular basis, and we want to share some some insights. So, as we all probably share the uh, the same findings as as clinicians and experts working with ACL patients, the number one most common, most important thing we can all agree to is really to gain extension in the knee right out of the gate and get that as soon as possible. But I think maybe how you gain that extension has some debatability to it, and we see a lot of stuff out there. You know, we've seen stuff on you know, let, let's hold a position on a towel roll underneath the ankle for, you know, 10 minutes at a time. Let's lay prone and let the knee hang off the table for, for a prolonged period at a time. And I don't know about, uh, but I do know about you guys, as a matter of fact, but I don't know about those of you listening, that how many people have actually prescribed that or used that on a regular basis to uh, to really deliver the care. And obviously the, the hell that you put the patient through in that scenario, you know, and I think the one thing that's really important to us is, is the neurology of the system and, and how the body works. And you know, when you watch, you're working with a patient, you see that they're they're guarded and they're, you know, held back. And you, you go to get mobility, essentially we're talking about gaining mobility in the knee. And you go to gain that mobility, but yet they're kind of like guarded and they're tight and their jaws tight. You know, how much are they really relaxing to really let that knee go? So, and then let's talk about some other ways that we get that. Maybe some thoughts that we have clinically, things that we see and have found to be effective. So, yeah, I think a perfect, um, you know, segue into that is for me a story. So right now I've got a case. She's one of the best fighters in the whole world in her weight class. She just had an ACL surgery. And oddly enough, right when I saw her two weeks out, she had perfect extension. It was perfect. Could activate the quad. It was nice and pretty straight. Measured it, did the whole thing. Well, about a week later, she happened to overstress her knee because she's so insanely phenomenal what she does for a living, which is kick ass, basically. Uh, she tried to overwork her knee. And once it got overworked and inflamed, she lost extension in a hurry. And all of a sudden, it was the classic, I'm missing 10 degrees of extension. So now I take this overstressed knee, and what do I do as a green clinician? I kick the shit out of it. I start pushing down on it. Of course I don't. But that would have been a thought of, oh, you're lacking extension. I'm going to get it today. In reality, it was all about stress, completely about stress, because she had it two weeks out, three weeks out, she didn't. How about that? It's a huge education component. I always find like I, um, I've sat in the OR with our more common surgeon in this region multiple times on an ACL. And it's funny cause he'll be cranking on them, putting the screw in, you feel him whacking away with a hammer with a screwdriver and the things like in there and then he's gent moving around and he's trying to check it into extension and flexion has full range of motion. He turns around. I was like, Aaron, that's why I put him on Percocet for five days. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so when the patient comes in, you have to understand that they got full extension in the OR. They got full extension right out of the gate. And your job is just to 
help them learn how to turn the quad back on. And there's a very simple method of doing that. It's just kind of like waking it up, doing certain strategy with your hands and, and not over stressing it, much like you said. And I think your, your story brings up a super good point too, where just because you have it one day doesn't mean you have it the next day. It, it often for me, that's the sign of like homeostasis, like the homeostasis check, especially early post-op. How are they doing? Are we overstressed? Did we push too hard this week or in the last couple of days? It's a really good kind of a measure benchmark for that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, obviously, so this is becoming an inflammatory phase, right? So, she got a little inflamed, a little bit swollen, and then we see that inflammation is going to probably be a bleeding pain causer in, in so many injuries. And then it's also going to be your, your range of motion deficit. So, if we manage that more with an inflammatory strategy as opposed to a, hey, let's gain mobility right away strategy, we'll get the mobility, but it, it takes a few days. And I, I think that's a huge message to uh, to take forth, like whether it be, you know, something like this, like an ACL or mini many uh, soft tissue repairs, post-surgical things or inflamed conditions. So, so inflammation being one, I think guarding is the other one. Maybe there wasn't this, maybe there wasn't this issue, you know, where they came out and, you know, they've just, maybe they haven't straightened their knee. The last time they straightened it, they tore it, right? A hyperextension injury, or maybe they twisted on it and it flirted it up, uh, caused the injury in the beginning. Haven't really walked on it a ton since. Maybe they've, you know, tried some stuff, but it's always been on this flex knee gait. And then they go in, have the surgery, and they come out. Maybe it's been three months, maybe it's been six months since they've, They've had that if you're dealing with a general pop, if you're dealing with a pro athlete, maybe it's been a week, but that's probably why they get extension back so fast. They weren't walking on a guarded <laughs> leg for six yeah, months. Here. Seriously. So in, in the real world, we see this general pop that really goes through this uh, this time period where they've been walking on a flex knee and they got to neurologically retrain that. And, and that's that's a tough go. That's mm -hmm. not something to get to get quickly or easily. I think we've got a lot of good tools. We use our hands a lot for this. I mean, a lot of soft tissue work to kind of, I always, I always tell our, our team like, you want to kind of invite the range of motion to come back as opposed to force it to come back, but really use your hands in a way to kind of invite the movement and welcome it so that the client can truly kind of let go and let that happen. So I think that's a big strategy doing some, some light soft tissue work. Of course, if it's swollen and inflamed, some soft tissue work there as well. I'd say that the research and the evidence really strongly supports some deeper tissue, a little more, a little more deep pressure, prolonged holds, a little slower approach to kind of get this gain of mobility, as opposed to doing things rapidly or quickly or doing oscillatory strategies. So slower, more prolonged uh, pressure tends to go to more towards relaxation of the patient. So, so that's a good method. Uh, we also, I've, I use the floss band a lot. I know that you guys do too. I think the floss band is a phenomenal tool here, especially with a younger person, ACL, you know, they're, they're maybe a little afraid, so you're not going to wrap it up tight on day one or anything. Maybe as you get a couple days into this, using a floss band to put some compression on, which by logical thinking would suggest compression is going to tighten the joint, tighten the, the tissue. But in reality, that compression provides neurological stability. And then it, it seems like you just see the knee kind of go right into extension right away. And it's like, well, the answer is it's a different stimulus, right? So they see their knee getting wrapped and protected. They feel their knee getting compressed in a different way. And this is all after, of course, you've built the trust with your hands and the way you move it and the way you approach it. Like all the students that I've had in the last several months and the couple employees onboarding, that the primary discussion when it comes to the first session after surgical, whether it's an ACL or whatever other knee up, um, is multiple points of contact and build the trust. And then they let you take their knee and they let you go through the range of motion. And so when you add in flossing, it's just another stimulus for them to perceive from their environment to say like, it's okay to move it. And if we're gonna really kind of go into this neurological uh, barrier that's gonna stop their knee range of motion, the floss is like bar none, you know, it's, it's better than most. You can even cup if you want, you could do, you know, various things with your hands, whether it's effleurage or if it's like slight deep pressure, like you said, um, it is a neurological game from the very beginning and, and it kind of starts with your trust and then the tools have every effect in the world depending on how you present them. Yeah, I think that's right. And then other times, once you've gotten to that point, it's making them do it. And sometimes in certain people where it's been hard to gain trust for whatever reason, I think where where the facility I'm at, we don't see a lot of immediate post-op. We see a lot of failed post-ops from other places. So sometimes that trust is a little harder to get initially and sometimes the the, the key or like the little trick is that you've got to make them do it. So you got to put them in a scenario where they can accomplish it. So whether it's like, you know, getting them to activate on the table, push it back in the end of my hand in a nice, basic, easy scenario, probably after we've gone through the same things you guys said, or as you put them in, start moving into weight bearing with using a band as a behind the knee as an external cue to get them to push into it, kind of taking their mind away from what's happening and, and, and letting them focus just on the task at hand.
Yeah, I think, you know, and a key part to this is we are talking about a terminal knee extension post ACL, whether, whether it is injury or, or surgery. And I think we can get confusing is, you know, we can, we can use great words like uh, encourage movement and let's invite movement, let's de-stress the tissue, let's reduce inflammation and let's get the job done with smart rehab. What gets really muddy in a hurry is when I start doing different gait drills and I, and I tackle balance or we're going to work on stairs and I need you on that bike, even though it hurts like hell. Now we have the person that just got out of surgery and we're giving them like 10 things to do when really we just need to do one really awesome thing first and then maintain that uh, during that, that first very difficult phase where pain is high, inflammation is just around the corner and, and really just kind of clearing swelling, de-stress, get some isometrics in there and relax and chill the fuck out. You know, in reality, like, and I think that confidence of a therapist coming in saying, you're going to be okay. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that confidence with my hands. I'm going to show you the confidence on how few drills I give you, I give you, because I know you're going to hit a home run here. And when you do that and they see the success, then that's the confidence it's, it's built. And then they trust the process and they don't freak out over their knee that can't extend. It's a 12 month game. Like, why would you rush it in the very beginning? Like one step at a time, the most important step is get that knee straight. because it's going to hold you upright when you're standing. And then you move on to the next step after that, if they accomplish the task and they own it. The clarity there is super important. You give them one, one objective. So your confidence, your, your confidence is, you know, emanating in the room, right? And it makes that so much easier for them to jump into that, that, that next step. I think if they're super clear on what the next step is, the kind of other pearl in what you said is, is you're, you're kind of putting this on them. You're saying, we have to get extension. I'm going to help you do it. Here's how we do it. But at the end of the day, this has to be you. So you're kind of putting the onus back on, on them. Mm -hmm. They've got to own it. So I, I think that's a big topic. I think a couple of ways to attack it there. And, and I love this concept of, of the one thing and keep it focused and simple uh, to your point. That's all. So the client can, can really wrap their head around and do it. I think they do like tools. So something like a floss band, a lot of times can give them a little bit of more motivation to do it. I've never met a patient after I've told them in the early parts of my career, Hey, I want you to use the towel roll and, you know, rest on this for five minutes. I've never had one come back and say, I love that exercise. I did it every day. <laughs> you know, the feedback is always like, uh, how, not, how am I supposed to do that again? It's like, okay, that's not working. So let's, let's find something that's more real. You give them a floss band, they get excited about it. You know, are you some cups on get excited about it? Or you show them how they can use it functionally and they get excited. So, Keep it simple and think neurologically in this state, I think, is, is the way to go. We'll advance this a bit more. We want to talk about this more as we progress through, uh, through ACL stuff. I think it's so important, but certainly going from this was kind of table uh, table talk, so to speak, on, on getting extension, but integrating that into, into functional movement. And, and that's going to come when we talk about our scorecard and our measurement strategies that we'll do in part two of this, of this ACL process. So, so I think that's a big one. A second big game changer, I think, that's early on in the intervention strategies that, that really can kind of move the needle. And, and I think it's really been, been incredible for us is using this concept of VFR, blood flow restriction. And, and we've, man, I've, we started early. Um, I'll tell you a story where I was kind of shocked by this when I first started. I was, I was at Athletes Performance and I was the director of, of rehab there in Phoenix at AP. And we had a we had an athlete come in, he was an MLS athlete, and he'd had four surgeries at this point, maybe five surgeries on his ACL at this point because he had sustained an infection. So they had to go in, remove the infection. Um, that didn't really get it cleaned up. They had to go in and remove the graft, let it heal, recraft it, the whole thing. So he was on his fourth surgery by the time I saw him. And uh, two amazing things stuck out with this. Uh, I'll give you the conclusion first. The conclusion is, is that he went back to the MLS at about four and a half, five months, which is not what I would condone from a rehab standpoint to uh, to get back. And I was very clear about that at the time. Like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, I do not think this is our best method. Um, although I couldn't really fail him because of how, how well he did on everything. So it was really incredible. But two things he did very early on in that process, which at the time for me, this was a little bit, what we now probably six, seven years ago, it was like 2013, yeah, seven years ago. He, um, he came into the clinic and he's like, hey, I'm doing two things. I'm doing a blood flow restriction strategy. And I'm also, uh, this is a little bit crazy, so I, I don't necessarily condone this yet, but uh, he's running on the Alter G um, at like day seven post-op, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that another time. But, <laughs> but the, uh, the BFR side of this, and I, the, the, like I said, best ACL I've probably ever rehabbed in my career as far as getting back and, and having incredible success, being 
super successful at the pro level following it. And, and for the next several years, the team ended up winning the championship two years later. Uh, so really played well. But nonetheless, was this idea of BFR. And the big thing with BFR that's such an advantage for ACL is you can't really load them as heavily early on in the process. And, and this BFR strategy allows us to load them very, very lightly, maybe 30% load or so very early in the process and really prevent atrophy. Mm-hmm. You know, Aaron and I were talking earlier today about this idea of, of atrophy and, and, and how probably the research has been showing that it's one of the biggest battles we face is that people are inactive after the surgery, of course, for four weeks, six weeks in some cases. Heaven forbid they have a meniscus repair and they're not weight bearing for six weeks. They're just going to lose that whole limb. So using BFR early and often, we found to be a really great tool to maintain that. But remember, we did it when we first started it here. We had the, Yeah, we did that wrestler. The wrestler, yeah. The wrestler. The wrestler was the meniscus repair, ACL, non-weight bearing for six weeks. Mm-hmm. We did BFR. I mean, this kid was a bit crazy. You know, he's in the military right now, as he should be. Yeah. He's nuts. And I love him for that. But he did. He came and did BFR Monday through Friday for uh, starting at like day seven, day eight after that surgery. And I measured the day he could weight bear. He did a full squat without an issue. His thigh was no different. And oddly enough, his calf was no different. Yeah. I was such in awe that I measured it and showed it to the doctor. Have you ever seen this? And he's like, what the hell are you doing with him? Like, I didn't put his foot on the ground. I'll tell you that. But it was, yeah, it was, it was blood flow restriction training. It's fantastic. Like I use it. Same scenario. You get the ones that are non-weight bearing for six weeks because of meniscus repair or some osteochondral defect or some sort. And you know for a fact that leg is going to shrivel up to half the size of the other of the other leg. And no matter what you do in any other traditional setting, but the BFR kind of comes in and saves the day. And if you can get them to do it every single day, which is the the 100 percent research driven way of doing it through Johnny Owens. Um that's what kind of gets the thigh back and really kind of sets them for sets them up for success as soon as they put their foot on the ground like it happens amazingly and then i think it also like in addition to that it kind of promotes this idea that they can still be physically active during that time period like one of the biggest pet peeves that i have for any post-op situation is that we allow the rest of the body become deconditioned that is an absolute pet peeve and it should never happen and Anytime we can kind of bring the surgical leg or limb or whatever it is up to speed to the other rest of the body by being physically active in a safe and appropriate way, it's a huge win. And I think people love that they can push themselves. I mean, it, it sucks, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's not, not fun. No. It's, it sucks. Lord. But I think people love the fact that they can they can push themselves with that. You know, they're a week out of this insane surgery. They think they've got this big, steep mountain to climb and they're in there like killing it on, you know, day one or two in the clinic, right? Like that's 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 a pretty cool thing to be able to push them like that. Those are those are cool stories. I think there's one thing to consider with this, though, not not to be contrarian or anything, but you know, it's awesome for from a hypertrophy standpoint. But it's a big physiologic load, right? It's mm-hmm. not really a tensile load that yeah. we're creating. So right. we need tendons and other mm-hmm. tissues to adapt. So this doesn't take the place of all the other loading and rehab. Mm-hmm. This is a, right. this is very good, very important early on. But there's a there's a super important steps that have many steps that have to happen later to get other types of load on the tissues. And, you know, I will say this, if you don't know what BFR training is, go ahead and look it up really quick and then come right back to this episode. But, you know, in reality, a lot of people are maybe a little bit scared or, you know, when it is a bit painful, they're kind of asking, you know, is this safe? And this is why we'll, you know, we as a, as a company lean heavily on Johnny Owens and Owens Science Recovery uh, to provide us that research of safety. But I'll also say this came out of the center of Intrepid and they have a lot more money than most people. And they do it on people who just lost their limb. So if we can do it on an, on an amputated limb from a warrior overseas and they come back and they need some muscle to, be able to, to regain some function, use a prosthetic effectively, then we can sure as hell do it with you. 14 days, 10 days post-op, you're safe. It's going to be a little painful, but we're okay. Yeah. Did you guys see the ESPN documentary on Alex Smith? Yeah, no, that, was, yeah. that was pretty awesome. I didn't use your watch right now. So oh. Johnny makes an appearance in there and they use BFR at time. His injury, like I highly recommend people go watch this, but the injury that he sustained was insane. He almost lost his leg, right? Yep. Flesh eating virus and yep. all that stuff. And it still looks like, you know, pretty mangled, but um, they use a ton of BFR. Johnny appears in there, the same, the same BFR tool we use every day. Here, and that's really cool. I think you alleviate the fear um, and you really kind of get them on board with your education beforehand. Like I always find that if you can really tell them, I tell them all the time, it's probably the most widely supported modality or anything that we do in physical therapy in rehab by far it's got over 250 like well peer-reviewed articles to support its use for multi multi-faceted like uh, musculoskeletal disorders but um when you can kind of lay it out there and say your bone's gonna 
improve. Your soft tissue is going to improve. You're going to have this growth hormone that naturally is stemming through your body. You're going to get muscle hypertrophy. And I promise you, you're going to be this much better in this short period of time. And they're like, I can put up with that. And I, I always subtly challenge them a little bit on this too. Yeah. When I put it on, I'm yeah. like, so just so you know, most people don't make it through. Yeah. First time. <laughs> and everybody's like, well, game on. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. And they do too. They just, they just ramp it up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you want to do evidence-based rehab, uh, you won't find more evidence on anything really in, in the field outside of exercise itself um, than, than this. And that's, that's, what, that's what attracted me to it. it. You know, I thought it was a new technique when I was mentioning that story you know, seven years ago now. We've been using it heavily for the last five. And it's, it's really made a drastic impact on our clients and over, overall extremely positive. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll make it a, a point to get Johnny on the show here and tell his story and, and kind of tell the difference tell the history of, of the BFR stuff and what he went through in his process to, uh, I would say, popularize it in the, in the, in the U.S. And, uh, it's really quite cool. So we'll bring him on and do it. It was, it was he was, uh, when he came here and taught the class to us, I, I took it from him in Austin, when he, right at the beginning, like four of us in the room. And then I had him come out and we taught the whole, our whole team here, which was, which was great a couple of years ago. At the time he was here, he was like, hey, Tony, give me a second. That was Alex calling. Like, yeah. here, let's get this. Uh, what am I going to do? How are we going to get this fixed up? So. So he's definitely been a big part of that process. It's great to see Alex back on the field. That's for sure. Uh, huge transition to go from what, what could have been to, to where he's at now. So back with the team now. Right. Yeah. Play. Yeah, Just exactly. Crazy. Yeah. On the roster. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal tool. We use it regularly, especially early on in the process to, to really enhance this hypertrophy phase, especially in non-weight bearing uh, lower extremity limbs. Is, we really find it tremendous. There's many other uses we use it for that we'll discuss as we, as we progress here. It's something that we kind of continue to use for quite a while, but once you can really load the tissue, if you can really load the, the limb and they can start to squat and lunge and put a, a, a strong physiological load to the tissue, it may not be as indicated. There's, there's research that says it still stimulates the hypertrophy process a bit faster than natural loading, but we use it a ton in the early phases. And then of course, just due to the nature of the frequency and the intensity of it, it starts to drift more towards physiological loads, which is the most appropriate natural thing, right? We want our clients to, to return to sport, return to the activities they love, and for me, that means you got to go. You got to go do this stuff. So that, that's big. Uh, one more thing on this topic, uh, just a little uh, question and and answer. We want to take a question from the from the audience throughout each episode. So I was talking to one of our uh, one of our network um, resident students. So so Jonathan now is just finishing up his uh, finish up his work at Creighton, and he's now in his internship phase. So he's texting me today. And he's like, he's like, hey, Tom, what do you think about this uh, using like a, an open chain uh, measurement for strength, like using a dynamometer to measure strength versus using some uh, some more uh, isokinetic strength testing, or even potentially some of the tests that we use, like a, a single leg, uh, a, a large single leg step down. We'll define that more in part two, but some more uh, defined, defined strength testing. So I thought it was an interesting question. And, you know, we talked back and forth about it a little bit and my, my take on it is that I think that this kind of fits into this BFR space is like his point was, can we, should we measure isolated strength of the quad before we challenge the more functional activities and hundred percent. And obviously BFR is designed to kind of build that phase up so that by, you know, somewhere between week six and week 10, you're, you know, you're, you're loaded and you're, you're kind of ready to go to some more active functional level. If you're going to start running, at three or four months and start some more impact stuff and some higher speed activities, you've kind of built up that strength in a way to, way to measure it. So um, in the past, we're not big on using these uh, dynamometers or hand uh, open chain measurement devices. But in that particular setting, I think that that made some sense uh, in that conversation to kind of assure that you have some baseline stuff. We'll go through some more uh, specific testing on this in our, in our part two segment to really define how we use this and, and what we do on a regular basis. But was that that was an interesting relative question. There's kind of a big push back towards that. I think this is where the question comes from. So Kim, one of our younger therapists, has um, she's done a lot of work on ACLs. We'll talk more about that project, I think, on another episode. But um, she's brought to me recently stuff, more stuff on open chain knee extension, which if you look at research from um, dating, probably not right here, but 20 plus years ago, that was that was a big deal that that was a huge mm -hmm. no-no, right? And um but that was still the gold standard end measurement for, for most lower extremity strength stuff. And then I feel like the pendulum swung way back where everybody's like all functional movement, all functional. But in this, in this kind of young group of therapists that I see all over social media, there's a big push pendulum swinging back towards measuring this open chain knee extension stuff. And so I think it's, it's relevant. I think his question comes from yeah. a place of probably all these other people, young therapists, new therapists he sees doing that. So. 
And I would like to make light. There is, is a big difference between having a test that you can pass versus doing a drill you know, 10,000 times. And I think that when you say maybe an open chain with, with, a, with something that can measure speed, power, and strength in, in, an, um, in an isolated fashion, specifically the quadriceps, you think, well, you know, maybe the NFL does demand that and we have to do that at month 12. That doesn't mean you actually have to practice it at month four or month five or month six. And I might even argue you could actually train the shit out of someone in a really great, phenomenal way. And they'd be able to pass that test without actually practicing that much. Because I know that the fear from you know what the original issue was, if you do too many of these early on in the process, you stretch out the ACL and now you have a, a lax knee and, and nothing's worse, I think, when yeah. it comes to enduring that type of surgery and having a loose knee. Um, so I think that to not confuse, uh, you know, for the listener, um, a test versus this is our training and we're going to do this most days of the week for the next nine months. Big difference just on repetition and uh, and kind of how we hold that conversation in our mind. Yeah, absolutely. So good. That kind of gives you kind of two uh, foundational topics here on the ACL and, and that transition, which I, I think are, are really valuable to look at extension and really owning that extension and thinking of that from maybe a neurological pathway or an inflammatory pathway as opposed to a, a scar tissue pathway, which is a story we've heard so often. Now, don't get us wrong. If there's scar tissue there, and it, that truly is the case, which I would say is extremely rare, but if that is in fact the case, then certainly the, the methodology to elongate scar tissue is necessary, prolonged stretch, maybe some more deeper fascial work, uh, manual or using instruments all makes really good sense there. But if the person's in pain, I would, I would stretch you in the way of let's get you out of pain first, let's invite the motion, let's make them feel more confident. And I think you'll see that that range of motion comes back quite easily. Mm -hmm. And then using BFR is a phenomenal tool too to really stimulate hypertrophy and really like resist atrophy is probably the best way to think about that. And in this particular case of a lower extremity injury, ACL in specific, where, where you're just going to have this atrophy phase. So, so hopefully that gives you some, uh, some good ideas and some insights and uh, could take it, take it from there with, uh, with your rehab process. But that's uh, always fun to talk about those topics and, and good. Heat. This was, uh, this was good. The drink was smooth as well. It was yeah. smooth. I think we probably need a little more next episode. We all, Finish that pretty quickly. Yeah. Pretty early on, I'd say. Yeah. Maybe two. Yeah. yeah. And there's some left over, so it's not, yeah. it's not the end this, of the this world. This is like right one now. of those awkward pours left where you can only give like one or two people some. So you just I'll, I'll buy the bullet. The, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Everyone take the sacrifice. Yeah. I think after every single episode, though, our intention is to really address a, a, a certain topic that we all feel very passionate about. And I think it's only led by one type of question for our entire field of physical therapy. And it's, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> I'm going to switch gears on this question. <laughs> what the fuck are we doing? Right? Yeah. You see it all the time. And I'm going to switch gears on, on the topic here because it hit my brain when we were talking about the, the knee extension was um, why are we, we isolate the VMO in a conversation? Why, what, what made us think at any point that a singular muscle, when you have three other ones, actually four other ones, does the job of knee extension. Terminal knee extension is the sole responsibility of the VMO. Or decelerates the entire body somehow. <laughs> <laughs> somehow. Somehow. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, to put it in that text of, of there is this huge impression. It was a huge movement through the 80s and the 90s. Of, like it was all VMO. And we still get scripts today. Hey, strengthen the VMO. You know, strengthen the VMO. And, and it, it goes along. Strengthen the VMO. And, and right along these lines, there's no open chain knee extension. You know, those two things seem to be really, <laughs> really strong themes yes. together, you know. <laughs> and, you know, because of why. Let's ask why is this the case. And, and the reality is that the research proved the VMO to not be the isolated mechanism back in the 90s. But. It became such a strong movement that here we are and, and it's still being followed today. And it's just yeah. one of those passed down things. Yeah. So it's not, in my opinion, it's not to say the VMO is not important, but rather that certainly don't, let's not discard the other surrounding yeah. tissues yeah. at the level that like to say the VMO is some sort of the primary focus. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even go that far is that you've really got to get strength back in the leg and, and real strength at the end of the day, you know, not, can I do a straight leg raise with my leg externally rotated? That is, that's not even an exercise in my playbook at this point in the game. I don't understand it. I don't see a reason for it. There's so many other things I can do to strengthen that limb and get that limb back into the position we want it to be to, to function. Yeah. I think when it comes to the distal quad, it's really, a, you know, it's a decelerator. You look at people who have phenomenally abnormally large distal quads, you usually talk about soccer athletes, downhill skiers, obviously bodybuilders and, uh, and cyclists. And they do a lot of eccentric work with the deep knee bend. And that's it. 
you know, do that. You'll get you'll get lateral quad, you'll get medial quad, you'll get it all, and it'll be functional, be good. But yeah, this the silliness of uh, you know, really that really need that VMO to kick back on. Like, what? How do you want to do that? And then you of course would say, Well, I have a needle. Like, oh, Okay, I think that might be the only way you can actually get a, better, a bigger VMO <laughs> is with a needle. And, and I don't recommend you do that. So I think you should probably walk out the door and, and come to us and do some you know, good PT. That's a, that's a good plug. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, indeed. I think it's a, it's a, that's a big one that we've got to change in, in, in our methodology and way of thinking is, is how, we, how we target uh, those particular tissues and how much of that we actually do. I, I think that from a quad standpoint, we've got some great stuff. I really like something I don't see very often clinically uh, outside of our group is doing some retro walks, you know, walking against the resistance band is something I, I was challenged with an ACL uh, kid played, played in the NFL. Uh, this, this is a great story. As a matter of fact, kind of led me to a lot of discoveries uh, with a professional athlete, but uh, he was running back, played for the chargers, ended up having a, and uh, did not dislocate his knee, but everything, but so towards ACL, PCL, MCL, um, LCL was intact, had two surgeries. I got him about nine months out nine months out of the surgery, I'd say. Um, and he really hadn't been doing a lot. So it was a classic story of like, hey, you know, I've been doing PT, my knee moves okay, but I can't really do anything. My leg's still small, et cetera. I want to get back to playing football. So, you know, I'm not a guy to say, no, we can't do stuff. It's like, well, let's prove to me that you can or prove to me that you can't, but either way, we're gonna we're gonna see what it can handle. So we, we took him through some stuff and, and a funny story was, you know, early on I was like, he could squat. So I was like, okay, let's squat a little bit. And like, hey, have you, you know, you've squatted before, so let's do some back squat. I just, what do you, what do you feel comfortable with? He's like, well, I've never back squatted before. I'm like, well, back up a second. I thought, I thought, I thought you played in the NFL. He's like, yeah, I, I, I do. And like, where didn't you back squat at least in college? I'm sure in the NFL as well. And he's like, no. Nah. He goes, whenever they did that shit, I just left the weight room. Man. I got, <laughs> peace out. I'm I not doing this right. And, you know, mind you, his other quad is bigger than both of my legs together, you know. So I'm like, okay, clearly squatting is not the answer to developing leg strength with this population. That was my first indication of that. And then with the hundreds of athletes and professional NFL guys since then, I come to realize that that is uh, squatting is not the only way to build that. Certainly it's a methodology, but that was pretty funny. So as we worked, as we worked to build his, uh, his leg back in this area of kind of VMO and quad strength and everything, we really went to using a retro walk, uh, which became funny. He was a, he was a little guy, he's about 5'10", uh, 230 pounds or so. I'm um, at five, about 5'10", 175 pounds at the time. So I used a, like a, a bungee cord, like a sport cord band. We wrapped two of them around him and I had him, I, I was pulling him and he was, I told him, I said, hey, resist me, don't let me pull you. So he did, and we didn't we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, and just like say, you know, he, he does no quad. Yeah, I still can't pull him, right? So I've got full lean back on this, and you know, he squatted down, and, he, and I eventually said, "Okay, let me win a little bit." But I want you to eccentrically walk towards me in this squatted position, and that was the first time I really used that exercise, and I had to because I had to find ways to really develop this quad strength and, and isolate it uh, for him to return. And that worked beautifully. At the end of the day, he went back and uh, went back went back into the league. Uh, and then end up playing for some other minor leagues uh, in his future. But uh, it was great to see him return. But that was where I started. Actually, I think it was a great way to build quad uh, endurance. To your point earlier on physiological tendon change, I think we see as eccentrics. Obviously, it's huge for that. So I love that eccentric sport cord walking. We're working a lot with ACLs. We're also working a ton with our uh, self patella tendon and patella femoral pain patients as well. It's a great way to kind of stimulate that strength. So. And if you don't have a sport cord, if you walk backwards uphill, it really kind of does a wonderful yeah. thing as well. Yeah. Gets the job done. Yeah. It's beautiful. I don't suggest you run backwards uphill. <laughs> Do or don't suggest. I don't. I don't, I don't I'm going to suggest that. I'm not a big fan of falling. I yeah, think yeah. That, people tend to fall yeah, there. The thing, yeah. no, no head injuries. <laughs> this was Kimecast, and we are the Kime Human Performance Institute. Thank you very much for listening. We'd love to continue the conversation with you. Please hop on our social media. It's at KimeHPI and engage with us there. If you'd like us to feature a topic or answer any questions live on the show, post your comments there. You can also check us out on our website at kimeperformance.com, and there you can see links to content that we've posted throughout our podcast for more information.